five of them that are living here at Aloka Vihara. And uh, this is the library that you see behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so I'm really glad to see each one of you here taking care of your lives in this way. This is a very important way of taking care of what needs to be engaged with in our lives. And so I think that uh, in keeping with the way that the, the day has typically gone in the past with um, the nuns coming once a month to the Dharma Collective, I will go ahead and start us out with uh, refuges and precepts. And just to say a word about that before you share screen there, Kati. Um, so, so the first part is uh, homage to the Buddha as, the, as an awakened being. And then we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But perhaps you could say, for me anyway, that it's a... Uh, a touchstone of sanity, the place that we turn to in our lives for real depth and guidance. And then um, the precepts, so these are the five precepts that uh, I'll offer in a moment, and those are the precepts and the, the Theravada tradition understands to be suitable for lay folks who are um, engaged in lots of different activities in addition to Dhamma. And, um, and I really encourage you to, um, to consider them. It's not a vow. We don't think of it as a lifetime vow as it is understood in Zen or in other traditions. It is undertaking a training. And you undertake that training for whatever period of time you feel committed to it. So with that, then, Kati, if you would put up the refuges. Wonderful. And uh, so she's doing a shared screen. And for folks who don't know, if you kind of hover up toward the top, at least on a PC, maybe at the, on an Apple, it's on the bottom, there's some view options. And you can zoom to a larger view with your view options on Zoom. So typically we do this call and response if we were in person, but since we're not, then we can all take them together at the same time. So you can just follow along with, with me. This is the first part is in Pali, and um, feel free to just stumble through it or let it wash over you and sit with the intention of it. Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranangga Chami Dhammang Saranangga Chami Sanghang Saranangga Chami Dutyampi Buddhang Saranangga Chami Dutyampi Dhammang Saranangga Chami Dutyampi Tsanghang Sadananga Chami Tatyampi Buddhang Sadananga Chami Tatyampi Dhammang Sadananga Chami Tatyampi Sanghang Sadananga Chami And now the five precepts. So I'll say them in Pali and then I'll say them in English and you can follow along with the English. 
Panati Pata Vera Mani Sikha Padang Samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana vera mani sikha padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara vera mani sikha padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musavada vera mani sikha padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. Sura meraya majapamadatana vera mani sikha padang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs which lead to carelessness. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And now we can chant all together the Noble Eightfold Path. So that has been, as probably some or maybe all of you know, that is the theme that uh, the nuns, the Aloka Vihara nuns, have been teaching over the course of the months. Uh, and we're in our third month now in the uh, topic of right speech, which I'll address in just a moment. But for now, we'll chant just the Pali of each one of the eight uh, aspects of the path uh, nine times in a row. So I'll do the nine times counting. And um, let's see, maybe I'll ring a bell when I get to time number, the beginning of time number nine, so we know when we're finishing. And, um, and you can just read the Pali along with me, and we'll just keep going around in a circle nine times. Samaditi sama sankapa sama vacha sama kamanta Sama jiva, sama vayama, sama sati, sama samadhi, sama ditti, sama sankapa, sama vacha, sama kamanta, sama jiva, sama vayama, Sama sati sama samadhi. Sama ditti sama sankapa. Sama vacha sama kamanta. Sama jiva sama vayama. Sama sati sama samadhi. Sama ditti sama sankapa sama vacha sama kamanta sama jiva sama vayama sama sati sama samadhi sama ditti sama sankapa Sama vacha, sama kamanta, sama jiva, sama vayama, sama sati, sama samadhi. Sama ditti, sama sankhapa, sama vacha, sama kamanta, Sama jiva, sama vayama, sama sati, sama samadhi. Sama ditti, sama sankapa, sama vacha, sama kamanta, 
Samma jiva, samma vayama, samma sati, samma samadhi. Samma ditti, samma sankhapa, samma vacha, samma kamanta, samma jiva, samma vayama. Samma sati samma samadhi. Samma ditti samma sankhapa. Samma vacha samma kamanta. Samma jiva samma vayama. Samma sati samma samadhi. Lovely. So we'll move directly into the meditation. And you can begin by finding a steady Posture, grounding yourself on your chair or the couch or your cushion. Allowing the vertebrae of the spine to naturally line up. so that the head can also align itself right above the spine. Maybe tucking the chin in a little bit. And allowing the chest to soften and widen in this open-hearted practice of meditation. Allowing all the muscles of the body to soften so that the weight can be carried by the bones. If you're feeling sleepy this time of day, you can allow your eyes to be a little bit open soft and unfocused, gazing downward. Or if you're feeling restless, you can place your hands on your thighs Allowing that energy to settle. Connecting with the breath, breathing the body. Wherever you find it is fine. Just noticing. And now 
we're going to do a meditation on the four elements. So you can begin by placing your attention on your feet. Maybe start with the left foot first. And knowing the presence of the earth element. All the cells in the body have some kind of earth element, but especially things like the bones, the toenails. No need to strain to perceive them, just enough to know that they're there. Earth element in the left foot. And now raising your attention up that left leg. Aware of earth element. All the way up through the knee and to the upper left leg. Grounded earth element. Now shifting back to that right foot. Earth element in the right foot. And raising the awareness up through the leg. Noticing the presence of earth element. All the way up through that right thigh. To the hips. Grounded earth element. And now up the body, up the main torso of the body. Steady earth element. All the way up that torso, slowly, slowly. All the way up to the shoulders. Earth element. And now down the left arm grounded earth through the lower arm and the wrist all the way to the left hand earth element now switching to the right hand aware of the earth element Moving up the right arm, through the elbow, all the way up the arm. Steady earth element. Now up the neck and the throat, gently observing earth element. And finally, the head. Steady earth element. And now beginning from the top of the head, water element. Just 
gentle, soft water element in the head. In the form of blood, in the form of saliva or tears. Water element. Gently, gently flowing. Now down the neck. And down the left shoulder, all the way down that left arm, aware of water element. Now moving from that left hand to the right hand, water element. Soft, gentle, moving up that right arm. And the right shoulder. Gentle water element. Now down the torso. Slowly, water element, all the way down the torso, to the lower abdomen, all those cells filled with water element. Moving down the left leg. Aware of water element. Down through the lower leg and the ankle. To the foot. Soft water element. And now back up to the right hip and moving down that right leg. Soft, soft water element. Gently moving the attention downward. All the way past the knee. To the foot, right foot, water element. Soft. And now we shift to the fire element. Warmth, heat, digestion, nerves being activated, fire element in the right foot. All the way up that right leg, fire element. Warmth. Fire element all the way up to the right hip. And now shifting to the left foot. Fire element. Chemistry, moving up the left leg, aware of the warmth, fire element. All the way up the leg to the left hip. And then the lower abdomen, fire element also represents digestion. Moving slowly up the torso, fire element. And the heartbeat also, fire. Moving all the way up the rest of the torso to 
to the left shoulder. And beginning to move down the left arm. Aware of the presence of a warm fire element. All the way down through the wrist to the hand. Now shifting to the right hand, warm fire element. Or perhaps coolness in the hands, the lack of fire element. But still there's some. Moving up the right arm. Fire, warmth all the way up the right arm to the right shoulder and up through the neck and the throat warm fire element and then the head all sorts of fire element Warmth. And finally now moving to the air element. Air. Nourishing the body, the lightest element. So air element throughout all the cells in the body as oxygen. Air element in the head. Lightness. Air element in the throat. It also represents movement. Air element moving down the left shoulder on the left arm, through the elbow and the wrist to the left hand, lightness of air element. Shifting now to the right hand and up the right arm. air element. All the way up to the right shoulder. And now down the torso, where we really see air element as movement in the body. Slowly lowering your attention down the torso, aware of the lightness of air element, down to the hips, and now down the left leg, air element. all the way down to the lower leg and the foot, a lightness of air element. Shifting your attention one more time back to that right hip and now down the right leg Observing the lightness of air element. Down that leg. All the way to the right foot. Aware of air element in the foot.
And now beginning to notice the elements outside the body, air element surrounding the body. Earth element beneath the body. Water element also in the air. And fire and warmth, temperature of the room. No substantial difference between the elements in the world we perceive as outer and the elements in the world we perceive as inner. Now returning the attention to the body this time, to the whole body at once. Staying with the whole body for the last few minutes of this meditation.
Now in these last moments of the meditation, taking the opportunity to observe the mind. How is the mind right now in this moment? Just having a look. Not at the thoughts necessarily, but at the attributes of mind. How does it feel?
Lovely. So I ended the meditation just a few minutes early because we have a very big topic to address today. So you can adjust your posture as needed. And I'll begin again with the Amethyst to the Buddha and the triple jump. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami As I mentioned earlier, we are moving one by one through the various steps of the Noble Eightfold Path. And the path isn't really linear like that, but nonetheless, we will talk about them one at a time in an effort to bring together some focus for each one of these topics and then perhaps you can see how to practice with them as a whole. So today's topic is on right speech. What a big, hairy, messy, beautiful, important, timely topic for us right now. Right speech. And to uh, to be sure, pardon my, my uh, fidgetiness, I, tweak my back a little bit this morning, so I might be adjusting as need be. To start out by saying this word right also, so samma, that's the Pali, huh? as we chanted earlier, means something like sound, like that was a sound decision. Or right in the sense of that which is conducive to liberation, that which is supportive on this path of freedom, of awakening moment by moment to freedom. And to be honest, there has been a lot of, a lot, I mean, you could write, there have been many books written about right speech books after book after book there has been a lot said i would go i would go out on a limb and say there's been a lot of fluff said in buddhism about right speech so we really need to focus in on what is it exactly and what is the what's our role in bringing forth right speech in the world in a skillful way but in a way that's real that's engaged that's actually meeting what it is that we encounter And the Buddha spoke pretty consistently throughout the early Buddha suttas about what he thought right speech actually meant and why it was helpful or not helpful to uh, fall into wrong speech. But there's one particular conversation that I want to share with you today, and it's a a sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya, so Majjhima Nikaya 58, so from the Middle Length Discourses. And it's um, a conversation between the Buddha and Prince Abhaya, Abhaya. And, and um, the prince was, long story short, egged on by a teacher from another tradition who is a contemporary of the Buddha's, 
to go and approach the Buddha with a question that he thought would trip him up. And the question was, do you ever say something that is disliked by others, that's difficult for others to receive? So a very pointed kind of question. And one that um, the Buddha didn't hesitate at all to say, well, this is a fairly complex matter. <laughs> That's what he says to Prince Abhaya. And, and Prince Abhaya is floored because he was prepared for a yes or a no based on the conversation that he'd had with this other teacher and how to refute either a yes or a no, but he didn't have really any way to respond to, well, that's a more complex question than you probably realize. So the Buddha goes through then a series of um, uh, examples, series of um, possible situations and describes whether or not to speak at that time. But the three, there are three things that he is looking at, three factors, if you will, that he's looking at in any given moment of speech. So one is, is it truthful, right? True or false? And in, interestingly, included with truthful in this sutta is substantive, substantive, meaning true about something that is material not material in the sense of physical, but material in the sense of worth saying because it's a truth that somebody needs to know. So is it true or is it false? Is it harmful or beneficial? Harmful or beneficial? So this is, this is looking at um, speech both in the mundane sense of whether something is harmful and beneficial, but also in the sense of whether or not it is conducive to the path. That's ultimately what the Buddha said was beneficial speech. Beneficial speech was, is speech that is conducive to the path. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But, um, but that really provides us with a very clear uh, rudder, with some very clear guidance, if you will, at the times when perhaps we're unsure. So is it true? Is it beneficial? And is it liked or disliked by the recipient? Liked or disliked by the recipient? So the Buddha didn't say, interestingly enough, he doesn't just go out and say, oh, it doesn't matter how it's received. Or that you should be completely guided by how it's received and say or not say something based on whether somebody likes it. He said, he said, there are some things that we need to look at in there. So the first instance that he gives is he gives something that's false. Oh, and let me also say, even just determining what's true or false, it's, it can be difficult. Sometimes it seems very obvious and, um, and it's not. I'll give you an example of this. When I was, um, I was living at San Francisco Zen Center in the temple there, and I was one of the residence reps. So one of the people who um, had the, volunteered to go to certain meetings um, and speak on behalf of the residents, but also um, to have a master key to the two main residential buildings there in the city so that when and if people lock themselves out of the building or out of their room and they need help at whatever time of day or night, some one of us residents and reps would show up with the key. So there were two of us, myself and this other gentleman who had the keys and were the reps. And, and he and I, we had extremely different manner, ways of speech, ways of communication, like very, very kind of two ends of the spectrum ways of communication. So things had to be talked through quite a bit to come to some kind of a arrangement. So one question was whether, because I lived in one of the two residential buildings and he lived in the other of the two main residential buildings here on Plate Street. 
And one question was whether we would put both phone numbers in both buildings or just one phone number in each building, right? For us people when they needed to reach us. And um, so after much discussion, we decided, oh, we'd put both phone numbers in both buildings. So we would write our names and our cell phones on a piece of paper and post it on the bulletin board, the residence bulletin board. So I went ahead and did that in the building that I lived in. And then some days went by before um, I noticed that it still hadn't actually gone up onto the bulletin board in the, the other building, the main building, a 300 page. But because it had been kind of difficult to iron this out with this guy, then I, I didn't say anything. I waited to see what was gonna happen. And sure enough, there was a piece of paper that went up the next day on the bulletin board and it had only his name and phone number on it. And I was so irritated. I was incredibly irked. Like we went through this whole conversation and why did I even bother? And oh my gosh, and I should have said something earlier and I should have known and on and on and on. And I was really kind of irked about it. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I'm gonna say something to him the next time I see him. So lo and behold, a few minutes later, I was walking down the hall and I see him and I walk up to him and I say, hey, I noticed that your, your name and phone number got posted on the board there. And before I even got a chance to say my second sentence, he said, yeah, so-and-so did it because I hadn't gotten around to it. And poof, my whole bubble exploded, right? The whole concept the whole proof that I had that he had done this thing that was completely different than what we had agreed on, just like that, just like popping a balloon. It was just like, in that moment, I was just kind of like, wow. You know, it seemed really obvious, like this was true. We had agreed on this and you did this, but it wasn't. So we really have to, we really, I, I encourage us to really be diligent about trying to investigate a little bit about what's true and how we form the, um, the ideas around that and how we speak about it even once we believe that we have an understanding hmm. to leave some room for the whole of the experience there um, and for our own mistakes, frankly. So I was really grateful that I hadn't chewed them out <laughs> because it was just, it was just wrong, you know. So anyway, it got fixed, obviously, and it all was well. But back to our right speech. So true. Um, so the Buddha says, in the case where you want to say something that's not true and harmful and disliked by the person who's going to receive it, then don't say it. So, okay, that seems pretty obvious, right? Don't say something that's not true, that's harmful, that's actually going to hurt the other person. And in fact, there's a whole discourse, this is not the discourse I'm referring to, there's a whole other discourse in which the Buddha says, this is speech like dung. When you say something, when you say you know that and you don't know, or you say you don't know when you do know, or you tell some kind of, of uh, intentional lie in order to harm someone. The example in that other discourse is in a court, actually, in a court, uh, what we would understand today as like a judicial court. And then the next one the Buddha says is, what if it's true, but it's harmful and it's not liked by the recipient? Then do you say it or do you not say it? Because it's true. And you want to get the truth out there, right? We are committed to the truth. But the Buddha said, no, you don't say it. You don't say it. So the example that came up for me um, was like a parent saying, I hate you to their child. That might be the feeling that they have in their heart in that moment. But that's a very harmful statement. And that's something that's going to be received in a way in a very, you know, obviously disliked, very, it will make that child sad or afraid or any number of other feelings. So just because it's true for that person in that moment 
doesn't mean that it's okay to say it. Whether it's in your inner world or in the outer world. If it's going to be harmful, then don't say it. So then another case that the Buddha offers is, what if it's not true and it's harmful, but people like to hear it? This is an interesting example. You might think, well, what would that be? But actually, this is, um, this is what sometimes some people call keeping the peace. Right? You say something that's not true, or you sort of skirt the reality for yourself, or you tell... And it's harmful because it's actually any kind of false speech, we could say, is actually instilling more delusion in the world. Let alone other kinds of harm that come out of that. Just the simple harm of saying it's instilling more delusion in the people who are receiving that speech. And it's actually in a funny way, or funny, strange, not funny, uh, comedic, funny, strange way, it is actually also fostering more delusion in yourself, right? That you think that somehow you can manipulate the situation by this kind of speech. So that's speech that's false and harmful, but liked by the receiver. And then finally, he, or not finally, because there are two more, but um, the next one is true, but harmful, but liked. True, but harmful, but liked. So a good example of this is gossip. I don't know if you sometimes have some friends for whom the easiest thing to do is to start complaining about somebody else around them. That comes from both of you sometimes. But, um, but certainly, it could, be, it could be saying things that are actually true about that other person, but that person's not present. And the person who's receiving it might like to hear this nasty stuff or true stuff that's being said about this person. But that's causing a harm because that's also a way of creating division and creating delusion and not really bringing your full self. Not really acknowledging the impact that it would have if that person heard what you said. So then there's a case which is, it's true, it's beneficial, and it's liked by the receiver. It's true, it's beneficial, and it's liked by the receiver. The Buddha doesn't even mention this one, because that's obvious. He's like, well, say it. <laughs> say it. It's true, it's beneficial, and it's liked by the person you're going to say. So it's easy to say. So they just get on with it. He doesn't even bother to use that as an example. right? That, that wouldn't be in, in question or at least according to the Buddha, it wasn't worth even mentioning that. But then he gives the one which is kind of the, 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 uh, the key here, or one that sort of directly addresses Prince Abaya's question. And that is a case of something that is true and is beneficial, but it's disliked by the receiver. Dhamma is actually often like this, you might have noticed. <laughs> we don't necessarily want to hear that there's non-self or that we are going to die and we better face it or any number of other teachings that come out of the Dhamma. Sometimes it can be very hard to hear. And so the Buddha, what did the Buddha say about this particular kind of speech? He said, Know the right time. Know the right time to say something that is true and beneficial, but hard to hear. Hmm. 
So we can't really know fully. We can't really gauge 100% accurately how our words are going to be received, right? Sometimes we get some nasty surprises in that regard or some pleasant surprises in that regard. But we do have a sense of it. We do have a sense of it and we can continue to learn over the course of our lives. We can, we can begin to learn how to tune into that. So this is the other side of it, right? Which is the listening side. If we're listening well to the folks that we are trying to communicate with, then we'll have some sense of whether it will be hard to receive or not. Again, we could still be wrong. We could still be wrong. And then we have to cope with that, you know, we have to engage with that. And, um, and this requires a certain kind of humility, I would say, right? Because we believe what we think about the world. So this is a place where we have to question ourselves, where we have to be very careful to question ourselves about how we understand the folks that we're interacting with. In Japanese, there's this beautiful, beautiful um, thing, uh, understanding that's built into the language, which is that you cannot say, so-and-so feels like X. That's grammatically incorrect in Japanese. You have to say, I think so-and-so feels like X, or maybe so-and-so feels like X. But to make a direct statement that this person feels like blah is considered wrong. They'll just correct you right off the bat. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Possibly. You know? You think that. You know? It's so interesting to see because that, that is, there's a certain, again, there's, that's, a, that's a kind of uh, wisdom embedded in their language that you cannot know with certainty. Even somebody that you have lived with and, and, and been intimate with for decades, there's still some surprises maybe, huh? Because we're changing human beings. So, so leaving open some humility in this case as well about whether it will be disliked or liked in addition to the case of whether it's true or not true. But knowing the right time, knowing the right time. And before I get into too much more of that, I also want to say, um, the beneficial part, the beneficial part, uh, in order to say that something conduces to the goal, then we have to know what the goal is. So in this case, we're talking about the goal of liberation, of complete, absolute freedom from greed, hatred, and delusion. That's a simple way of putting it. There are much more complex ways, but that's one. And the way that the Buddha talked about what conduces to that is the Four Noble Truths. That's the most succinct way of that the Buddha described to us what is it that's helpful on the path, right? Because if we look at the, if what we understand in the Theravada to be the Buddha's very, very first discourse, he lays out the noble truths and he says, there is dukkha, roughly translated as suffering or perhaps more subtly as unsatisfactoriness, fundamental, a sort of fundamental unsatisfactoriness or unreliability. Or also just things that are painful, what we call dukkha dukkha, just pain. Right. So there is dukkha. And he said, he said, when I realized this, then there was a light that arose in me. There was a wisdom that arose in me. There was a knowing. Just that much is helpful to whatever degree you can find it in your life. Any degree of understanding suffering is helpful.
any amount. In fact, the next line in that sutta, in the Dhammachaka Sutta, Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, he specifically says, and dukkha is to be understood. That's what we're supposed to do with it. Understand it. Understand it. Because he knew with great wisdom and from his own life's experience that just saying, I'm going to get rid of it is another source of suffering. Right? It's another, that's, a, that's a form of denial and rejection and ego driving and any number of other things that will very definitely obstruct any progress on the path. So you have to approach it from the standpoint of, okay, when it's present, I know it's present, and when it's present, then I try to understand it. Then I do my best to understand it. So that's what's beneficial, right? That's what's beneficial. Speech that actually clarifies for us the presence or the absence of suffering, the presence or the absence of unsatisfactoriness. So do you see where I'm going with this? So now think about what's happening in the world. There are people who are expressing a lot of suffering. A lot of people expressing a lot of suffering. And there are other folks who are saying, no, 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 they shouldn't be making so much noise. They shouldn't be so angry. We want more peace in the world. Okay. Yes. It's my aspiration that all beings might find their, their peace in their hearts and their lives and their minds and their environment. But the peace cannot be forced. People have to be able to express their suffering. And this is how they're doing it. Now, mind you, expressing suffering by angry speech, that has a cost. It has a cost because anger is also painful to the one who is holding it, to the one who's expressing it. But perhaps at least it's been my experience in my life, and I know that it's the experience of many of the, of the black folks and the brown folks and the, um, so many folks who are expressing, poor folks, we were just on the, on the uh, virtual march yesterday. People who are expressing these kinds of pain, perhaps the cost of the anger and the cost of the, the difficulty of bringing that forth is feels much less to them than the cost of not doing that, right? The cost of not being heard, the cost of losing more lives and having that be okay, rather than a tragedy, rather than something that we can address. So know the time to say something that is true and it's beneficial, but it's hard for others to hear. Say it, but know when to say it. And I would suggest that right now, this is a time. This is a really critical time. This is an opportunity. This is a time when, when, when many folks can suddenly not turn away for whatever, any number of various reasons, they can't turn away. And so this becomes an opportunity. Just as all dukkha, all dukkha understood and skillfully, wholesomely responded to is an opportunity. So with that, I'm going to thank you for your time and your attention and your practice and open it up for a few questions. We have about maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 if we run over a tiny bit. And because we're a small group, then the way that I'm going to take questions is you can 
raise your actual biological hand <laughs> and I will unmute you and you can um, you can ask your question or make a comment whatever dialogue feels uh, helpful and wholesome at this time Because if they're, oh, here we go, from John. False, not harmful, light. I gave, can I read this, John, aloud? Yes, you can. Okay, or do you want to read it? Uh, I prefer you read it. Okay. John says, I gave false statements to my mother about her cancer to give her hope and to keep her spirits up, even though her doctors told me she would die soon. When the doctors refused to give her any more chemo or radiation, I had to tell her the truth. Speaking the truth broke her heart and mine too. Was it better to break her heart later rather than sooner? Hmm. I mean, this is exactly the, the point of our, uh, our uh, discussion here. So false, not harmful, and liked. Um, so when, when someone is dying, they are going through their process and anyone who knows them is also going through their own process. And those two things may or may not be in alignment or synced up at all. It's hard. It's hard. It's a very intense time. And I would add to that that there is, despite lots of statements of certainty, there is also a fair amount of uncertainty in medicine. There is, there is always a certain amount of not knowing. I was a hospice chaplain. I was a, both a hospital trained uh, chaplain for a time and, uh, and then a hospice, home hospice chaplain for a time. And, and you couldn't be on the service unless you had a diagnosis that you were gonna die within six months. But we had plenty of people who were on our service who had been there more than six months. So the this so the 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 giving her hope. I can understand that there is there is um, you know. Um, there's always hope in our hearts, even when hope is not supported by others. I think oftentimes there is hope in our hearts, even when we know that something else is true. There can be hope in our hearts for some other kind of an outcome. But I think that the, that the issue is that it was going to break her heart one way or the other. It was going to, it was going to be hard for her to hear. And you knew that. And so trying to choose the time, trying to choose the time in a, in a not exactly skillful way right because that's what the lying that's where the lying comes from by trying to choose the time by lying instead of by doing it a different way so so it's not for me to judge whether it was the right thing i wasn't there i don't know but i can't say that um in those situations where people wanted to conceal the truth from the folks who were dying. It wasn't always the best bet. It wasn't always the right thing to do. Because, because maybe if they had the time, they could come to some kind of relief about it. But we, again, we don't know. We don't know. So in some cases, I've seen people actually speak the truth in a way that was really compassionate, like say everything around that thing that they didn't want to say. 
you know what I'm saying? Like the medicine or say everything around that thing. But this also points out, John, I will say thank you for being brave enough to share it. Thank you for being brave enough to share it. Because to me, it also points out that um, it, uh, telling, speaking falsely can feel very compelling when we feel like the consequences of truth are too much, are too high. So, time for one more question or comment. Yes, Carl, you're gonna, there we go. Thank you, Kathy. So is there, we've been talking about right speech and what, what would the Buddha say about, you know, this idea of maybe not speaking and perhaps you should so yeah yes that's a very good question there's also another discourse on that also in the Anguttara Nikaya um, in the Anguttara Nikaya fours I was going to save that for later because I'm going to give a talk to the Berkeley group tonight and talk about that but I will say this that that briefly put um, in that sutta the Buddha asks um, a seeker from another tradition you know what, whether that, uh, what to do in that case. Should you praise somebody who needs to be praised? Should you, um, you know, criticize somebody who needs to be criticized? Or should you remain silent? Or should you do both? Praise and blame, or what should you do? And the seeker says, I would remain silent because equanimity is uh, the highest value. And the Buddha says, no. The highest value is to say what one knows to be true so the highest value is to praise those who should be praised and to criticize those who need to be criticized which is again a very sticky proposition you know that's a very tricky proposition for us as fallible human beings and as folks who are easily uh, you know wedded to our own view of the world but if we can do it in a way that's skillful and kind, I think that putting, putting that information, in fact, I would say, I would go this far actually also, Carl, to say this, it's our obligation when we see somebody causing harm in the world to, to point that out, to do whatever we can, and maybe we can't do anything, or maybe we can't do much, or maybe we could do a lot, but without causing further harm, it's our obligation to intervene and tell that person to stop causing harm. Why? Because you're actually helping them not create bad karma for themselves. You're helping them. That's a compassionate move, in other words. If you fail to say something when somebody is harming someone else, that's actually not being compassionate to them because they're going to go and create that horrible karma. All right, folks, we are at our time and you have been very attentive and I really, really appreciate that. So I'm gonna chant a very brief blessing chant for you and wish you all a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day, rest of your practice. Um, please keep practicing right speech as best you can. Please stay safe and well and healthy Take care of your hearts in this difficult time. So.
please take care of your hearts. Maybe some Brahma Vihara is always helpful. Bhavati Sabha Mangalang Rakantu Sabha Devata Sabha Buddha Nubhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te Bhavati Sabha Mangalang Rakantu Sabha Devata Sabha Dhamma Nubhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang Rakantu Sabha Devata Sabha Sangha Nubhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te which means in English, may you have every good blessing, may all the devas protect you by the power of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. May you ever be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, there are some links in the chat if you'd like to practice dana, um, but your presence is um, the ultimate dana and the best thing you can offer the sangha. So thank you all for being here. I hope to see you at another sit another time. Go in peace. Thank you so much for setting this up. Happy to come back. I will. Thank you. I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs>